the Go Dyslexia podcast, where dyslexia experts share strategies, technology, products, stories, and more. And now, your host, author, and personal trainer for the brain, Dr. Erica Warren. This episode of the Go Dyslexia podcast is brought to you by GoodSensoryLearning.com. I am so excited today to have here with us Dr. Michael Hart. We became fast friends this past summer and a course, but uh, more than anything, um, I think we are both dyslexia experts and we both have a passion about serving this population. And so welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me again. It's great to see you. (laughs) Great to see you too. So tell us a little bit about why you are a dyslexia expert. Sure. So I think about that question in terms of education, training, and experience. So I'm trained as a clinical psychologist. I have a PhD in psychology. And during that formal training time, I've gotten a lot of courses that are specific about assessment, learning disabilities, different types of issues that children deal with, because I was always focused on kids and families. So from that foundation, I got a very significant amount of clinical experience in some really special places. And so ultimately I ended up at a place called the Kennedy Krieger Institute, which is part of the Johns Hopkins complex. And I had the real luck and honor of being able to work with Dr. Martha Denkla, who is internationally known as one of the top people in learning issues in the whole world. And it was very fortunate. I got to spend quite a bit of time with her over the course of a couple of years. From there, I went to I became the chief clinician at a school that was specifically for kids who had learning issues. And as all of us that are listening know, 80% of the kids who get identified as having learning issues have language-based issues, i.e. dyslexia. So over the course of my career, I think I've done at least a thousand evaluations, numerous untold numbers of consultations, spent a lot of time in the classroom. uh, And now, Um, I'm kind of taking what I learned in my private practice and and taking it online. So I do webinars, as we did, and uh, courses, and I do consultations still with teachers. And I really focus on uh, three main groups, educators, parents, and specialists. So I've amassed quite a big, long time of experience, and this is my passion. This is what I love working on, and and, I hope that shows in my work. Yeah, it does. It does. I've been really impressed by your work. Thank you. So um, now one of the things that you're an expert on is this whole concept of RAN. Mm -hmm. What is that? And tell us a little bit about how this impacts individuals with dyslexia. Okay. So RAN is an acronym for Rapid Automatic Naming. And the researchers found that when a child is struggling with rapid automatic naming, the certain types of tests you can give, that will very strongly predict that they're going to have difficulties with fluency and comprehension specifically. So what's happened over the years is that, you know, we've done an extraordinary job with regard to understanding phonological processing issues and how that impacts decoding and the really basic substrate skills of being an effective reader. We haven't done as much work with regard to understanding all the way back to a neurobiological level. What does, if a child is decoding fairly well and they're really struggling with fluency and comprehension, what does that mean? What does that mean about how their brain is functioning and what does that mean about what we should do? So it's become clear now that that dyslexia is not just phonological processing. Clearly there are issues for some kids with rapid automatic naming tasks, which is what I call it is the tip of the iceberg because it reflects issues in much more deeper complex language processing. So, um, and then there's a lot of discussion about sometimes kids are specifically struggling with orthography. And I'm quite sure you see that in your practice where, you know, they're decoding okay, you know, their fluency is okay, but their, you know, their spelling can be just atrocious. So... When you say orthography, can you define that for the audience? Yeah, orthography refers to the rules that a language uses for spelling or the printed word. 
So when you're talking about orthography, we're talking about, you know how people talk about how in dyslexia, they confuse their P's and their D's and things like that. That's really kind of a misnomer. That's a myth. Really, it's about the child's ability to uh, rapidly and accurately perceive the symbol, which would, in this case, a letter or groupings of letters that make words in a very efficient and automatic fashion. What I talk about in my webinars and when I do when I give talks and I do other things, I talk about how consciously we as professionals we move from this idea of automaticity because we were thinking about you know decoding and phonological processing and the goal is to keep help the kids become more automatic. But when we're talking about the higher order stuff like orthography, we're talking about thinking about it in terms of connectivity as well. So when you think about a fluent reader, what they're able to do is they're able to look at a letter or word. They're able to access their memory. If they have, you know, if it's a sight word, then they know what it is automatically. But if they have to decode, they have to say, okay, I know what that letter is. And this is all in milliseconds. I know what that letter is. I got to access my database to make sure I know what that letter is. Then I got to access my database to make sure I know what sound is connected to that letter. And that has to happen like literally within milliseconds. So if there's a breakdown with their ability to rapidly and efficiently know what that letter is or know what that word is, then you can see how that would flow into a problem with fluency, right? Right, and, and really impact processing speed. Right. It is all, yeah, it's all about processing speed. Yeah. Processing speed, and it interrupts your thought. So, right. that, you know, if you're trying to, say, get a sentence out, so to speak, um, you can lose your train of thought because you're then trying to think of a word. Yeah, it's just not, it's not happening for you. So it's kind of like the way I describe it is you have a bucket of energy when you're reading. And you spend a certain proportion of your energy on the decoding part. And if you're really struggling with that, you don't have any energy left for the fluency or comprehension. If you're struggling at the fluency level, then you're going to lose, lose, use a lot of energy just trying to read fluently. And that's going to have an impact on the ultimate goal of reading, of course, which is comprehension. That's right. That's right. Because, you, yeah, you, you can... You can only be an effective reader, which is multitasking, if some of these things are automatic. Mm -hmm. So, of yeah. course, if something's not automatic, it's just going to interrupt your attention, which is going to interrupt your fluency, which is going to interrupt your comprehension. Absolutely. Yeah. So, what on earth can we do about this? Well, there, this is what I was kind of mentioning earlier. There aren't, you know, when, when you're talking about phonological processing, there's all kinds of approaches out there, right? Yeah above and beyond Orton Gillingham. But when you're talking about specifically intervening with fluency and comprehension, there's nowhere near as much out there. So I oftentimes ask people, whether you're parents or specialists or teachers, to look into a program called Connect to Comprehension that was created by this woman named Lynn Gibbons. And what she's basically doing is, and this is a quote from Marianne Wolf, but it's kind of like, as instructors, we need to organize around the, the reader in a way that reflects how the brain should uh, be doing it naturally. So in other words, we're kind of shoring up the child's sub-skills in this area because we know that, that it's, it's not happening efficiently like it does for a non struggling reader. So I kind of call it, uh, you know, building a container. And let me... Let me talk a little bit about what that would look like. I actually have a couple of notes here. So we're going to train the visual system to rec recognize the letters, right? We're going to very consciously and specifically work on that and not make assumptions that it's going to come naturally to the child. Yeah. So, okay. And then we're going to connect those visual representations to the right sounds, Mm -hmm. So we're going to be really explicit, and this is what you do in your work. We're going to be yeah. really explicit and structured with regard to how we connect those two things. And then from there, as we help them build, we're going to help them build speed in terms of recognition and retrieval. Yeah. So instead of assuming that, um, and there's another piece to this too, but if instead of assuming that 
the kid's brain is just going to do that automatically. We have to assume that we need to be very uh, systematic and specific in our actual teaching. And I think that's what um, my friend Liv Givens has done extremely well, is that she's created a very, very well-organized packet of information that will help a teacher do those step-by-step -step systematic processes that'll that's been showing some really wonderful results for her in the state of Florida. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, I, I mean, I have a game that I created called, Hey, What's the Big Idea? And that helps to get kids to categorize and organize information more effectively, which helps with memory. But also, the very last podcast that I did with Aaron Ralby, who is a linguist and language, uh, and sorry, memory expert, Mm -hmm. And I started to take his course. It's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And what he does is he assists memory by using two things. One is visual memory. One is spatial memory, which are very, very intact for us, particularly dyslexics. Mm -hmm. And um, it's having a profound impact. I mean, I've always used memory strategies, but integrating some of these new principles that he's bringing in of the spatial and he does these memory palaces, I'm finding that um, it's, it's making a pretty profound difference. And I can't wait to finish the course so that I can integrate the principles into my instruction with students because I think it's going to have a pretty big impact on RAN. But uh, yeah. yeah, it is hard. And, and of course, it's, you know, when you're trying to work on RAN, um, you're having to work on the recall, the fast recall of very specific things. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't always apply globally so you can exercise ran so i can learn maybe i struggle with flower names and i can learn all the flower names but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to to uh apply to other yeah. objects i have to use the same type of mindful memory strategies and encode them in a way that I can retrieve them quickly and even out of sequence. Yeah, I think that's a perfect point. It's all about we need more of more of these well-organized programs. We need people to be aware of them. And it's going to be hard for them to become aware of them and start using them until they really realize people are catching on now about uh, rapid automatic naming, but you know, there's still a kind of a big gap between, well, okay, fine, we know that, but what do we do? Right. So, like instead of having this rote learning and this passive learning, we need right. to we need to be working with the brain and developing neural pathways and strengthening them uh, so that, that we can access, again, so that we can access these objects upon will or these names upon will and, and maybe even, you know, out of some type of order. Because mm -hmm. you know, an, an order can help, but, but if you have to access something out of order, um, you really have to have a very strong, organized framework cognitively in order to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. especially with the English language, because there's so many exceptions to the rule that it's one of the most difficult languages to learn how to read in. That's right. That's right. So it's, uh, it's kind of a challenging but you know i think uh, i think our job the you and i our job is to yeah. continue to get the word out there and since you work still working directly with kids i mean you're what you're doing is exactly what you should be doing which is trying out new things understanding things differently and implementing that in your actual practice yeah absolutely yeah and and you know i learn from every single one of my students because every student has a different pattern of cognition yeah. And, um, you know, whenever I get a student that I can't quite reach, then I go back into research mode and start searching for tools and, and, then, and then implementing aspects of them and taking my prior knowledge and kind of like a big salad, kind of throwing it together and, and playing off of the student, really watching the student and see what, see, you know, you want to watch to see what makes them tick. And once you figure out their formula, that's what it's all about. It's about that individualized uh, attention where you're really putting together, you know, tools that are very unique and needed for that individual. Right. It's, it's the art and science of what you do. I remember Martha Denkler used to tell us, she goes, just be careful. Just remember every kid's brain is different because when you're doing assessments, a lot of times you get into, you have a, 
protocol that you follow and you do the same tests a lot oftentimes and you get these scores and you say, all right, so this, this, and this, and you're not paying enough attention to where the real variability is. Mm -hmm. So it's, I see it still, and I bet you, you do too, where a child will they'll go through an Orton Gillingham approach and they'll be successful and they'll still be struggling as a reader. And it's like, hey, man, we just did Art and Gillingham. That should, you know, that should solve everything. That's right. And it causes a lot of confusion and, and tension because, you know, finally, after all this struggle, they find something that works, the child is improving, and then they get to a certain point where it's like, well, we've worked our way through Art and Gillingham. We can't, and we still have struggling. So we got to go, like you do, we got to go back through and better research, we've got to pay attention really closely and figure out where in my toolbox can I apply a different approach with the child yes. so that they can see the progress continue up and moving up and become a more effective reader? And that's really hard to do. It is. And, and this is the thing is, you know, we have a single word to diagnose a child. Okay, I'm dyslexic. Maybe one of my students is dyslexic and then a parent is dyslexic, but we're not, we're not the same. So even though we all have dyslexia, there's slightly different nuances and there are many different characteristics that can make you dyslexic. And there are different types of dyslexia. So I could have auditory processing deficits that could give me that diagnosis and I could even have like a combination of auditory and visual uh, deficits or even bringing in more of the memory issues but no I've never worked with two kids with dyslexia that I work with in a similar way and yeah and I've got one of those kids right now oh my god what an adorable little guy and he is such a hard worker but this kid and he knows OG back and forth and he can do it and he knows all the different types of syllables and he's got that down but his processing speed is so slow that, um, you know, and I'm having to make up new things like, okay, we've got to melt the sounds together to make mm -hmm. words. You mm -hmm. know, blending wasn't quite doing it. We have to like, you, you can't stop the sound. You have to melt them, <laughs> you know, but yeah, That's just cool. the intensity of how hard he's trying. And remarkably, I can't believe it. He's comprehending. It doesn't matter how hard he, I'm not comprehending what he's reading because I'm, I'm working with him at that slow pace, but he is. But the question is, how can we increase the speed and the fluency? You know? Well, that's a good point. You know, when you talk about auditory processing difficulties or visual processing difficulties, they're more global, right? Yeah. They can, they can profoundly impact your learning uh, beyond, beyond just academic or beyond just reading. So, mm -hmm. It could impact your social relationships. It can impact uh, your work uh, load or where any, you know, how you work or how you understand people and communicate with people. So it's, it's you know, it uh, behooves us to just get as much information and education as possible because we don't want to miss anything. And the more that we can find clear language to describe how a child's brain is wired, the more effective we're going to be in terms of being going to be able to draw a line between that side of the brain is wired and this is what we need to do to help remediate their issues very, very explicitly. Right. And, you know, quite frankly, that's just hard. It's really, really hard. It is. And you just have to be creative with it and you have to be open and you have to watch, watch like a hawk, watch the students, see what right. works and see what doesn't work and, and pay attention to what they're doing. Even with their bodies, you know, I had one little girl that every time I asked her what the letter sound was, is she jumped. And I was mm. like, hmm, okay, well, we need to integrate that into our lesson somehow. And next thing I know, I was using yoga mats and she was jumping to the letters, mm -hmm. you know. So being creative like that or paying attention to what they love. Like I've got a little boy right now that, um, yeah, he's, he's really hard to reach, but he loves trains. Okay, so I'm, there it is. I, need to, I need to integrate trains into this somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, how can, I, how can I make OG into a, into a train? Oh, okay, well, let's see. I guess the sounds could be different train cars and we could pull them together, you know, whatever, whatever it takes. And actually mm -hmm. his issues are more in the area of math. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really getting creative and that's what makes my job fun. If I did the same thing with every student, I'd 
I, you know, it would be like working with a conveyor belt. It'd and, be a grind. And it's not, it would be a grind. And if you can look at it and, and try, to, try to stop looking for a formula, unless you're looking for a unique formula for each student. But yes, I, that's why I don't like programs. And I don't ever use a program because it takes that, that gift of vision out of it. You almost put on blinders and you just go through the program. You and I have talked about this. I mean, um, you know, we can differ a little bit. I mean, I, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, there's a lot of really great approaches. But if you're at, I mean, you're at the PhD level with uh, X number, I mean, 15, 20 years worth of experience. Yeah. So you, you're able to do that and do it effectively. Whereas, you know, a lot of people still do benefit from the structured programs because that yes. them and, it, and it really helps the kids. So that's just something you and I kind of talk about back and forth. But yes. I, I, would, I would just say because of who you are, you're less need, you need less of that because you have a very broad skill set. Yes. Other, other people may not be at the, you know, at the doctor level and they still want to kind of, you know, or they could be earlier in their career. So having something really structured really helps. And then as the yes. years go by, yes. I, I remember when I was giving WISCs, uh, you know, the intelligence scales, and I, 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 like I said, I've given a thousand. And it got to a point where I was more interested in the child's behavior during the testing and less so than the test scores because yes. Yes. I could use that. I could use what I'm seeing to write up the report in a way that creates a whole person out of this little guy or little girl, yeah. not just, you know, a bunch of test scores, but I can think and watch how they're processing or how they're approaching tasks. And that tells me as much as the scores themselves. But yes. you, gotta, you gotta do a lot of them before you can do that. Yeah, well, the other thing is I'm a huge fan of OG. Mm -hmm. Huge yeah. fan. And do I integrate it? Absolutely. Do I integrate it with all of my uh, dyslexic students? Pretty much. Pretty mm -hmm. much. So to me, it's an approach. And, and that is, there is a pattern to that approach. And there is a pattern that I follow with that approach. So, um, you know, more than anything, it's just telling people to don't get so stuck on an approach. Mm -hmm. That you that you lose lose the the individual, you right. know. Um, but yes, there it it's a very well defined sequenced approach, which is very very successful. And yet, I do believe that if you don't have a ton of experience, starting at square one and going right through a program is 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 wonderful for families, for parents, for tutors. And, and for many specialists. And you'll see that as the specialists get more and more um, versed with the program, they can get more creative and maybe slightly change the sequence for an individual. But if you're ever working in a group, you have to follow, you have to follow the program, the sequence, mm -hmm. yeah. so, that, so that the child doesn't have these <clears throat> empty pieces within their, um, within their instruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wish we supported our uh, general ed teachers better in terms of understanding the importance of the multi-sensory systematic and structured approach, yes. as well as how the what they need to understand about language and how that is so key to appreciating how you approach teaching a child how to read. And we're, we're not doing a good job of that, and uh, so we need to do a better job of that. You're absolutely right. I mean, if there, if there is not a structured approach, then we're sending kids out there with all these gaps. And, you know, it's like that. I often use the analogy of the game Jenga. You know, if, if you don't have a strong foundation, you know, the, the tower will fall. And, right. and to me, a lot of these OG principles, which I believe should be integrated into the general ed class, because it really is that it really breaks down language into the logic of language. Yeah, and I think it robs teachers of the skill set that they need to have to do a good job. Right, right, because a lot of them just don't even know about it. Yeah, and, and they, but many of them are just craving more information to figure out how they can be more effective as teachers, and we're not, we're not doing a good enough job in giving them that support and those resources. That's true, that's true. I mean, even, even, even with a doctorate, I felt coming out that 
I didn't have anywhere near enough tools and that I had to continue my education and do the research. And yeah, I mean, even with all of my education, I was never trained in OG, mm-hmm. never. And so to circle back to wrap it on like naming, yes. we've got we've to help the teachers understand what that means too, because that's going to be really confusing. It looks confusing. Yeah. The child is, is kind of basically decoding on a kind of okay basis or even a really good basis, and they're still struggling with fluency. If the teachers don't have a model for understanding what's going on in a little child's brain, then that, that makes it really, really hard for them to figure out what to do about it. You're right. What they end up doing is they just repeat the same thing that's not working. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, so, yeah, you know, getting, educating them, explaining to them what it is, is going to also give them that sense of creativity so that they can recognize it and then possibly do something with it. Yeah. You know? and, and you can get creative with it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, it's just a matter of, again, the, it's like the student tells me the way to go. It's just mm-hmm. being, being open to that. Because, yeah. you know, so many of these kids, too, you know, they're shut down to learning. And if you can use the things that they love in your instruction, they right. open up to the learning process. Well, I can't thank you enough for joining us in this discussion. I think that you've really brought up some really amazing points here and, you know, that we just need to continue to stay open to all the new research that's coming out. And we're learning more and more about the brain, which is a incredibly complex thing that we need to stay open to, you know, all the, all the new ideas that are coming out and the new methods that are coming out so that we can continue to serve the needs of all of our students. Yeah, I I just think it's our job to keep pushing to get that information out there to support people. That's our job. I mean, you know, I I know that many people listening know that the neuroscience with regard to phonological processing has been really clearly fleshed out. We know the neural structures, the primary neural structures that are involved. We know that what's going on between the pathways of those structures. Uh, we're just now seeing the research, uh, clear evidence that there are different neural pathways specifically related to issues with fluency and comprehension. So what that means is the more we learn there, the better we're going to be able to understand how to treat them. That's right. So, so it's, I think it's our job, Erica, is just to keep putting it out there and supporting people and educating people. And, you know, it's just, uh, it's the most important thing that we can possibly do. That's yeah. right. And That's of course, that the brain is plastic, you know, right. and, mm-hmm. and we never really used to you know, the research did, that's fairly new, you know, yeah. that, that actually, that even different parts of the brain can take on roles, right. uh, so even postmortem studies show that the dyslexic brain is using different parts of the brain than the normal brain or the average brain for reading. So, yeah. and, really and we we were able, we've also been able to show. I want to make sure people know this that we can increase neural activity in those structures by providing intervention like a Norton Gill and Cam approach. You can actually see the difference pre-treatment and post-treatment. So we know that it's working. Yep. And, and that's super important that people understand that we can improve the child's functioning. Right. And even if, you know, even the student that still needs more assistance of mine and he's been taught the OG approach, he's 90% there. It's just a matter of finding that last little piece and then it's all going to come together for him because he's right. got the tools. We just now have to work on the processing speed. Right. Yeah. So it was very exciting. Thank you so much for joining us. And there were so many great nuggets of information and I want to encourage everybody to go to your website and I'll go ahead and post all of your information in the show notes and probably throw some images over the top of this video. And uh, I think you're doing some really cutting edge stuff. And thank you for being out there and sharing your knowledge. And uh, I'm sure I'll probably ask you to come on again in the, in the next year or so to let us know what you're up to. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. 
Thank you for tuning in to the Go Dyslexia podcast, where dyslexia experts share strategies, technology, products, stories, and more. If you need the show notes or want to check out the webinars, blog posts, and resources, go to GoDyslexia.com. Be sure to sign up for Dr. Warren's newsletter and follower on social media.